According to the United Kingdom, a Russian battalion lost almost all of its armored vehicles in a failed attempt to cross a river near Zerovdonetsk in eastern Ukraine. Images from the scene show dozens of burnt-out tanks after Ukrainian forces shot pontoon bridges across the Seversky Donetsk in Luhansk region. The UK's Ministry of Defense says the incident reveals the pressure Russian commanders are under to take to make progress. It isn't clear how many soldiers were killed in the battle, but Moscow's forces appear to be making gains elsewhere in the area. Meanwhile, a Russian soldier accused of killing an unarmed Ukrainian civilian has appeared in court. The first alleged war crime case since the war began, Vadim Shishimarin, 21, who faces possible life imprisonment on charges of war crimes and premeditated murder. Here's more on the situation in this report. A Ukrainian court today began the hearing of the first war crimes case arising from Russia's February 24 invasion after charging a captured Russian soldier with the murder of a 62-year-old civilian. The case is of huge symbolic importance for Ukraine. The Kyiv government has accused Russia of atrocities and brutality against civilians during the invasion and said it has identified more than 10,000 possible war crimes. Russia has denied targeting civilians or involvement in war crimes and accuses Kyiv of staging them to smear its forces. Meanwhile, the foreign minister of Sweden, Anne Lind, says the country's membership in NATO would have a stabilizing effect and would benefit countries around the Baltic Sea. This is coming the day after its neighbor, Finland, committed to applying to join the 30-nation alliance. Ms. Lind told reporters when presenting a parliament report on security that Swedish NATO membership would raise the threshold for military conflicts and thus have a conflict-preventing effect in northern Europe. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has forced Sweden and neighbor Finland to publicly pick sides after remaining outside the U.S.-led Cold War alliance since it was founded in 1949. On possible gas cuts for Finland, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov says that a report in the Finnish newspaper that Russia may cut gas supplies to Finland as soon as Friday seems to be fake. He called it another newspaper hoax, adding that Gazprom remained a reliable gas supply. The newspaper had reported on Thursday, citing unnamed sources, that Finnish politicians had been warned that Russia could halt gas supplies to its neighbor on Friday. In central Ukraine, Russia's defense ministry has claimed that its forces had struck the Kremenchong oil refinery in central Ukraine, destroying its production capacity and fuel tanks. In a daily video briefing released, Defense Ministry spokesperson Igor Konashenkov said the Russian military had also taken two Ukrainian multiple rocket launchers and a U.S.-made air defense radar. The ministry also said its forces shot down a Ukrainian Su-27 aircraft in Kharkiv region. Following the decision by the UN Human Rights Council to set up an investigation into alleged human rights abuses by Russian troops, Chinese Foreign Ministry says that the decision by the Council has shaken members' trust in the body. UN Human Rights Council resolution to set up the investigation passed on Thursday by a strong majority, with 33 members voting in favor and two, China and Eritrea, against. According to China, its objection to the vote is due to the UN failing to look at some countries that wage war while choosing to target others. And as Russia's war in Ukraine entered its third month, details of atrocities continue to mount. Journalists covering the conflict are taking a more cautious approach. According to media groups, including the International Press Institute, several journalists, foreign and Ukrainian, have been killed since February 24. Dozens more have been wounded, either by incoming fire or being shot at while on assignment. The National Union of Journalists in Ukraine reports as many as 20 reporters could have been killed, a figure that includes includes 
those victims where the circumstances of death have not been determined. Joining us now to talk more is Emma Bergman, uh, Free Press Unlimited FPU Program Coordinator, Safety and Emergency Response. She joins us now from Amsterdam. Emma, thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you. I know that Free Press Unlimited has been supporting journalists around the world covering different areas. What's it been like supporting journalists in Ukraine? Uh, journalists in Ukraine have been targeted and continue to face unprecedented dangers for carrying out their work. Um, in addition to the dangers that they of course face while covering war and conflict, we also see that journalists in Ukraine have been specifically targeted. Uh, they have been kidnapped, they have been killed, uh, they have been attacked, and sometimes they refused um, safe passage from cities under, um, under siege. Due to the rapid evolvement of the situation in Ukraine, it has been extremely important for us to, uh, to provide a very rapid response. And thanks to the flexible mandate of our emergency program Reporters Respond and our connection and collaboration with newsrooms, um, media outlets, journalists associations and international organizations, we have been able to support over 400 journalists in Ukraine thus far. In such difficult situations, uh, conflict, what are the kinds of things or, or support that journalists need the most? One of the main needs that we see at the moment is really a need uh, for support to relocate, either internally within the country to a safer area, uh, but also sometimes externally, if the journalist really faces direct threats, they may need to relocate outside of the country um, to a neighboring country, for example. Um, and in addition, in order for the journalists to continue to uh, report on the conflict and be more safe, there's also a huge need for personal protective equipment, uh, such as bulletproof vests and helmets. Um, and of course, medical trauma kits in case something happens, so they can uh, say, so they can do first aid. Um, in addition to the physical aspects, we also see a huge need for digital security support, for example, VPNs, uh, so they can uh, continue their work without surveillance. Um, and what we also should not forget is, of course, a huge impact that covering conflict has on the mental health of journalists. So we've been really focusing on providing psychological assistance to journalists as well as setting up support networks between journalists so they can support each other. And honestly, talking about their kits, uh, bulletproof vests and helmets, that hasn't really helped seeing, uh, you know, the, the killing of uh, our colleague Shireen Abu Akhle uh, over at the West Bank. Um, but then looking at, you know, this war, this invasion, in terms of the nature of reporting, do you think that that has changed for journalists who are covering difficult situations or should it change? Well, unfortunately, I think what we see is that the, the safety of journalists globally is deteriorating at an alarming rate. Uh, with anti-media rhetoric on the rise, so too is violence and harassment against journalists. And we see that journalists are not only facing dangers in conflict zones, uh, war areas or crisis situations, uh, but also that globally on a wide scale, uh, the media freedom and safety of journalists situation is really deteriorating. Um, this is because of the rise of global author of global rise of authoritarian governments, um, political polarization, the dissemination of fake news. Um, we see that the threats against journalists are evolving more and more. It's not just physical. There's also a lot of digital threats against journalists, online harassment, especially women journalists, and also legal threats trying to detain journalists under certain new legislations, emergency laws, or even under the guise of COVID-19. So what do you see happening? What should be happening to protect journalists? Um, I believe that in recent year, years, there has been increasing attention towards the safety of journalists. Of course, uh, in 2012, the UN Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists uh, was adopted, and there have been nine resolutions by different UN fora. Um, and th these global standards, they have led to a good framework uh, for regional and national mechanisms. There's also uh, been the development of the Media Freedom Coalition in July of 2019, um, which is a partnership, partnership of different countries who advocate for media freedom and the safety of journalists. So we have definitely seen positive developments, but unfortunately in many parts of the world, uh, these support mechanisms are not enough. And we see that the safety of journalists continues to be, um, continues to be threatened. So there's not enough to protect journalists, to prevent legal threats and to combat impunity.
Well, this is an issue we will keep, um, you know, putting our spotlight on indeed so that, um, you know, the, the right things can be done. We appreciate your time. Emma Bergman uh, with Free Press Unlimited is the Programme Coordinator Safety and Emergency Response. Thank you for joining us on the programme. Thank you for having me. And Finnish Foreign Minister Pekka Havisto has said that Finland was in a bumpy moment following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Earlier in the day, President Sali Ninistro and Prime Minister Sanna Marin said Finland would apply to join the Western Defence Alliance NATO without delay. Finland, which shares a 1,300-kilometer border and a difficult pass with Russia, has gradually stepped up its cooperation with NATO as a partner since Russia annexed Crimea in 2014. Now we are, of course, at a very pumpy moment because of the Russian attack against the Ukraine. I hope that one day there is a peace and we also have a peaceful neighbor and, and the uh, cooperation continues normally, but we are not yet there. But it's very important for us to keep the border peaceful and our authorities are working over the border on, on guarding the, the border and, and, and currently everything is peaceful. And we have done it actually all the way that when the Sweden had their first parliamentary committee meeting, I participated in that and explained how Finland is preparing for the NATO, NATO process and, and possible membership and so forth. And, and of course, uh, we, we could a little bit influence Sweden on the timetable issue. They, they were hurrying a little bit their own timetable, so it looks that during the same week and decisions could be made in both countries. Meanwhile, according to President Tayyip Erdogan, it was not possible for NATO member Turkey to support plans by Sweden and Finland to join the pact. He says the Nordic countries were hosted terrorist organizations. Ms. Erdogan told reporters, he says, quote, we are following the developments regarding Sweden and Finland, but we don't hold positive views. He added that it was a mistake for NATO to accept Greece as a member in the past. Turkey has been officially supported supportive of enlargement since it joined NATO 70 years ago and a decision on enlargement must be made by unanimous agreement of its members. Dr. Michael Ogo is a senior lecturer, Department of Political Science and Public Affairs, Babcock University. He joins me now for more. Uh, welcome to the program. First, what do you make of Finland's intentions of joining NATO? Some analysts say there isn't any threat from Russia. So why this decision? Um, hello, and thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so the, the intention for Finland to join um, NATO you know, is only, I mean, it's only obvious considering the issues on ground. Um, I mean, one would, one would not have expected um, some, some six, seven months ago uh, that, that Russia was going to invade Ukraine, you know, and bear in mind what is going on now, um, other neighboring countries uh, close to Russia are just taking precautions. So I think the move by Finland, the move by um, Sweden to join NATO are just precautionary moves that these countries are making, you know, to keep themselves safe. Um, um, it, uh, basically, in, in the light of what is going on at the moment and what Ukraine has had to suffer in the last uh, couple of weeks, so I'm not I'm not so surprised about about these moves. And um, I just I just I, I mean I, I just hope that Russia is able to see you know, the fallouts of the action that they have, um, you know, of, of this invasion that they have, that they have um, continued to press on with. And Ukraine's foreign minister insists that the country wants EU membership. Um, but what about being a member of NATO? Considering all that, you know, Ukraine has lost, con considering all that has happened since February 24. Yeah, so so you know you know the thing with Ukraine is that Ukraine Ukraine is Ukraine is just seeking some kind of um um it's seeking some kind of alliance, it's seeking, it's seeking some kind of you know belonging. It, it, it wants to belong to a certain international organization, to a certain uh, group, you know, to make itself more formidable. Um of course in light of what they have suffered, you know. So um it is obvious that now we're beginning to see the relevance perhaps of international organizations, international alliances, you know, and maybe Ukraine is, is now beginning to appreciate more um, these things. Of course, you know, it is not going to be very easy for Ukraine to join the EU now, considering all the 
all the criteria they have to meet and you know all the process that they have to uh, they have to fulfill. Um, but it is it is just interesting that we are beginning to see the relevance of these international institutions as Ukraine, you know, and all these other countries are clamoring to become members to join. Um, you know, this 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 Russian invasion has has really shed some light on the positives and negative aspects of um, international alliances. And it is just interesting to see how this is unfolding. But in terms of the negatives, uh, what would you say they are? And this is also um, within the ambit of this invasion. Yeah. So, so um, in, of course, of course, the negatives, the negatives have to do with the fact that lives have been lost, right? Uh, there are so many. There's, there's so much property being destroyed. There's, there's there's so much resources that are being wasted, you know. And the fact that, uh, I mean, you, you can see that the Russian, the Russian ideology. You know, of of being of being anti-West, uh, you know, is 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 what has is what has led this invasion, is what has continued to motivate and propel this invasion up to this point. You know, so the fact that um, these these uh, these these states, mean being Russia and Ukraine now, are not are not able to come to terms to um, to understand and to agree on certain things. Uh, you know, is 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 something that is just uh, is, is just is just unfortunate, you know. And of course, the West, led by the US, the West led by the West led by the US, will continue to to expand their frontiers. Will continue to accept as many countries as want to join. You know, Finland, Sweden, and even if the Baltics also want to join NATO, the West will open its arms. You know, and this this invasion has put Russia in a very compromising situation because Russia. They have never envisaged the fact that um, this invasion will propel other states, you know, to begin to, to begin to review their, their membership of NATO and begin to seek to join. Um, but it is becoming it's becoming more and more obvious that Russia is Russia is 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 perhaps more porous now because they are going to have more neighbors that are that are that are members of NATO. If of course this this be by by Finland and Sweden goes to. Uh, then of course Russia will be flanked by more members of NATO, which which is not very good for the national interest, of course. Mm. Um, Especially yeah, neighbors who are uncomfortable, uh, you know, with what they've done uh, with Ukraine. But but many wonder um, if this war will actually come to an end soon. What is your calculation? Yeah, well, in, in the words of Zelensky, the words of Zelensky, Zelensky, you know, some some weeks ago. Uh, in fact, I, I think I think about a month ago um, was was said to have to have hinted that this could be a third world war, you know, if Russia doesn't come to terms or come to the negotiating table to try and sort these things out, you know. So if that is Zelensky's position, and of course we already know Putin's position, the fact that he's not backing down until um, eventually he gets Ukraine to where he wants Ukraine to be, you know, politically dependent perhaps on Russia, um, then it is obvious that there's no end in sight, at least for now, um, there's, there's no end in sight. And I think that, like I've always been saying, you know, the two parties involved are the ones who hold the key to, to this conflict coming to an end. Uh, Putin and Zelensky need to come together and have a conversation. You know, they have, there has to be negotiations. Negotiations that are not going to compromise the integrity of any of the states involved, you know, and that would would lead to a win-win situation for both parties because um, it is not possible to have a kind of zero-sum outcome from this from this conflict. You know, you know. So, so in the in, in the near future, it is obvious that this war um, is going to continue until both parties involved can come and negotiate a peaceful settlement or a way out of this of this conflict. And only today, uh, we heard President Zelensky say he's ready to speak directly with the Russian president, uh, and he says only without intermediaries. Um, of course, we have always known uh, Russia's position uh, in the past about this direct face-to-face -face talks. Uh, who knows? We'll hear from uh, the Kremlin soon on what President Zelensky has said. I would like to appreciate your time on the program. Thanks a lot. Mr. Michael Gu is a senior lecturer, Department of Political Science, Public Affairs with Babcock University. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me.